Okay, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and jump into this study. I, uh, I would like to, um, if possible, have a few volunteers to do some scripture reading. Um, so who would like to uh, look up passage of scripture? Sir, would you take Genesis 6, 3? Who else? Raise their hand. Okay. Um, Jerry, would you take Acts 7, 51? And Donna, would you take Galatians 5, 16, and 17? And uh, as, we, as we hear these passages read, let's um, just try to think about what's going on in this passage as far as the, the topic this evening. So it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's pretty much the same work in each text, so we'll uh, read each passage. And then um, I'll ask if anyone would like to take a crack at what we're going to be looking at this evening. <laughs> okay, Genesis 6-3, do you have that, Sarah? Okay, and then Acts 7.51. Okay, and then Galatians 5.16 and 17. Okay. Now, did, did anybody see the common denominator between those three passages? I see a, a, at least one nodding of a head. Anybody like to take a crack at it? Okay, so this passage is talking about a struggle between the two, uh, at least the last one is. Uh, what, what do they all have in common, though? Uh, what, is, what is the one person that's common in all three? The Holy Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit doing in all three? Maybe the first one's a little bit more difficult to see it, but uh, the second one is quite uh, clear. Okay, and to do what? Okay, not, not in every case, but um, certainly in the case of believers, okay? In believers, this, this would be sanctification, but not in unbelievers, because he's doing a work in both believers and unbelievers. Yes? Tells them to what? Uh, well, certainly in the believer's life uh, and, and the unbelievers in a certain sense. I'm, I'm thinking more of, uh, of just maybe the opposite of that. <laughs> ah, okay. Keeping them, yes, keeping them from doing the really bad stuff, or maybe not in every circumstance, but at least generally, right? My spirit shall not strive with man forever. Apparently, he's striving with man to do something. Uh, let's see. Uh, Stephen says to uh, his Jewish audience, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Okay, the, the Holy Spirit in this case was, was trying to get them, of course, to go in the right direction and to get them not to go in the wrong direction. And certainly he does that in the lives of believers. Now, in the second instance, uh, he's doing that in his Old Testament church. So he's working in the church in those last two examples. But in the first example, he's working in the unconverted. Well, basically, what we want to look at is the fact that the Spirit of God uh, restrains sin. Okay, that's one of the things that he does. In believers and in unbelievers... So let's, let's take a look at, at some of that. Well, let's, let's begin by looking at the fact that he restrains sin in the believer. Now, let me ask you a, a question. I'm going to actually try to get you to tell me most of what we're going to be looking at this evening through questions. But 
is it important that the Spirit of God restrain our sins? Okay. Do we, do we still sin? We still have a desire for sin? Okay. Now, why is it important that the Spirit of God restrain our sin? Okay. Okay. Okay, so his um, restraining our sin will bring us closer to God. Pleases him? That's right. It honors him? Does it do anything else? Okay, if he restrains our sin, it improves our witness, and uh, that also helps the kingdom of heaven move forward, doesn't it, as we live more like Jesus? No? What's that? That's right. Now, notice in that, with the uh, third passage, the Spirit of God is... Uh, struggling or wrestling against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and so forth. So there's this battle that's going on. But the spirit is restraining our flesh. And as he does that, of course, it's kind of like two opposing principles in, in our souls. And if one is stronger, the other one's weaker and so forth. And so as he struggles against our flesh, then our obedience gets brighter and stronger. We become better witnesses and so forth. Uh, and we dishonor the Lord less. Um, people do read our lives. They, they look at us when we say we're Christians to see what our lives actually say about Jesus Christ. So um, we do need to be careful how we live. So we want our sins to be restrained. The Spirit of God does that. It's what God wants. By the way, do you want your sins restrained? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we want as well. It brings honor to God. And it causes the kingdom of heaven to move forward. Now, what does the Spirit of God do to restrain our sins? And basically, he does two, two main things. I, I, like to, uh, I like categories. And uh, sometimes it makes it easier to put everything under broad categories uh, to help us um, you know, maybe hold on to it. So what does the Spirit of God do to restrain our sin? There's two main things that he does. Okay. Okay, and that actually will fit under one of the two categories that I'm thinking of. But let me let me give the categories, and then you you try to fill them out. Unless you want to take a shot at the categories. Common grace, yes. Now we're talking about the two main ways in which, and this applies to believers too, uh, that he restrains sin in believers, and and common grace is certainly. One of them, although we usually think of that in terms of how he restrains the sins of the unbeliever. But um, anyway, think about this. The Spirit of God, uh, what is his nature again? Okay, his nature is love. And, and if the Spirit of God is doing something with regard to love, will that, uh, will that help restrain our sin? Okay. All right, so... He increases love or he reveals God's love. And then what else might he do in order to restrain our sin besides reveal love to us? Or reveal God's love to us? Well, he makes us hate it. Yes, that, that would uh, kind of fall into the category of, of love, but that's good. I'm thinking of another. Well, what's the opposite of love? Hey, okay, well, it wouldn't be the opposite of, of love then. It'd be, but fear is what I'm looking for. Is the fear of the Lord, does that help us not sin? Okay, the fear of the Lord. So the love of God and the fear of God. Okay, so, so two things. Now, what, what are some of the ways that God reveals, or the Spirit of God, let's say, uh, reveals this love to us? And again, it could be, we could be the subject, we could be the object, or whatever. And how would that help restrain our sin? 
What's that? Okay. So if the Spirit of God produces love in our hearts for holiness, then it'll make us hate sin. And if we hate sin, we're not going to want to do it, right? Okay, now that, that's one way. Is there, is there anything else under love that um, the Spirit of God does in order to uh, restrain our sin? Okay. So if we love God, we don't want to offend God. That's right. And that would make, well, especially, I was thinking about this. If we really love the Lord and we know what it costs the Lord in order to have us, in order to bring us into this relationship, the cross of Christ. I mean, he had to die on the cross for sinners or for, for sin, for our sins, in order to reconcile us to God. Now, if we really love God, every time we look at the cross, we should um, hate our sins even more because that's what it costs God in order to save us. Okay, so we don't want to offend God and we certainly don't want to spite our Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life on the cross in order to take away our sins that we might have life. Okay, what's, what are some other ways then that love can work to restrain our sins? Okay, love for God was one. Yes? Okay. Okay. So if, if the Spirit of God works in us not only love for God so that we don't want to offend Him, but He also works in us the love for His Word or His commandments so that we want to go that direction. If we want to obey God, that will make us not want to sin, so that will restrain our sin. Um, okay, sir? Okay, so as we love the law better, we love our neighbor better, and in doing so, we sin less, right? Okay, anything else? Donna, did you? All right, okay. All right. Um, you know, think, think, about, um, think about this too. Um, think about, you know, turn that around. I mean, we're thinking about our love for God. What about his, his love for us? When somebody loves you, uh, how do you feel about offending that person? How do you feel about doing things that they, they don't like? And when we love somebody, we don't want to do something that offends them, but also when they, when they really care about us, it should make us also not want to offend them. So I think God's love for us, a, a sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, just knowing that, that he loves us so much and wanting you know, not to offend him perhaps is another way to um, restrain that love. Um, and I think it may be along these lines. Um, when, when you're walking in obedience, is there any, um, well, maybe we're falling into another category. No, okay. How do you feel? How do you feel when you're obeying God? Okay, joyful? Um, uh, okay. You usually feel pretty good, don't you? Uh, do you know the, um, the that one uh, that one? Well, it was actually a true story of uh, Eric Little and his uh, uh, fact that he was a missionary, a you know Scottish Presbyterian missionary, and he was also an Olympic runner. And uh, when when he was uh, talking to somebody about why it is that he love to run, he said, because when I run, I can feel God's pleasure. Now, I guess what he was saying by that is he believed he was doing God's will by doing this, and God was approving of what he was doing. He could feel his pleasure. Do you ever feel God's pleasure when you're obeying God? Do you, do you feel his pleasure when, in, in that obedience, you, you see the Lord using you? Um, when you give up something that perhaps you wanted to do in order to do that, do you ever sense God's approval? Now, what about when you don't do it? And when you're not walking with him or you're sinning and disobeying and so forth, how do you feel? <laughs> you don't feel good. <laughs> don't, don't feel so good, do you? Don't feel his pleasure, but rather his displeasure? Yes. D does that dynamic help you obey and does it restrain sin? 
okay? So even just the sense of his love for you, because that sense of his pleasure in a certain sense is uh, that's sort of God filling my heart with his love and, and then when I do something wrong and I don't feel so good, you know, he's, he's registering his displeasure. Perhaps that's more along the lines of how our conscience maybe bears witness with whether we're doing good or bad, but we don't like to feel bad. We like to feel good, and that's an incentive. And one of the ways by which the Spirit of God helps us uh, to obey God and restrains our sin. Now let's see. Um, how does he, does anyone want to add anything more to the love part? <laughs> okay, so the Spirit of God instills or he, let's say he, he uh, increases or brings home, as it were, the love of God in our hearts. And this is one of the ways that he uh, sort of ministers out of his own character uh, to work within us a Christ-likeness, giving us a greater love for God, a greater love for his truth, his commandments, so we walk in his way and we sin less. But now let's go to the, uh, the opposite. How does he restrain sin through fear? How does the fear of the Lord impact us, and how does that uh, restrain our sin? How does he bring that home to us? Consequences. What kind of consequences? <laughs> Negative consequences. That's right. What kinds of consequences are there for sin besides the bad feeling? Sometimes it could be death, chastisement. The Bible does say that God disciplines us when we do what's wrong so that we may learn holiness and walk in his ways, become more like him. Uh, death, there is a sin unto death that apparently even Christians may be able to commit, seems from scripture. Uh, there is that fear. Uh, if, if you sin a lot, and um, say even as a believer, is, is there any other kind of fear that can come in to that besides the fear of discipline, the fear that God might take my life? That's right, and if that's the case, then what are you afraid of? God's judgment. Should the Christian not be afraid of God's judgment? No, we should, we should fear the Lord because, um, you know, I mean, the fear of the Lord in the book of Hebrews, for instance, the author to the Hebrews is writing to a group of believers, and yet he's constantly warning them not to turn away from God. Why would he do that? I mean, can a Christian turn away from God? Well, not a true Christian, okay? A true Christian can't fully turn away from God and, and fall away. I should say, can they you know, completely fall away? And yet, that's what he's warning them not to do, right? So is there a sense in which the Lord actually does warn true believers not to fall away, and does he use that as a means to restrain their sin? Yeah, I mean, the fear of judgment. How many times has the fear of God's judgment caused you to turn away from your sins as a believer? Because you're afraid, you know, you may, you may in the end be proven not to be a believer. Well, that's exactly what the author to the Hebrews was warning his audience. So. There's certainly that fear. There's the fear of, of discipline, the fear of death. There's the, uh, the fear of God's judgment. And how does the Spirit of God um, bring those fears home? What does he do? How does he convict us? Okay, through conscience. But of course, being Christians, we have our consciences informed by something that's even clearer by the Word of God. You know, we, we well, the Spirit of God can take and, and bring the, the threatenings home from Scripture. Because I mean, how do we know about all these things? How do we know about discipline? How do we know about death? Uh, at least the possibility of death. How do we know about the possibility of judgment? Except through the Word of God. So he takes the Word of God and he applies it. By the way, he does the same thing with regard to the, the love. He uses it as a means to, um, well, to enforce certain things upon us, such as his love for us. But our love for him, of course, would be more of a subjective thing. Um, okay, let's see. By the way, too, um, even if we are assured that we are believers, um, the Spirit of God can still convince us that what we've done is, is, is wrong, of course, is sin, 
And he can still show us what those sins actually deserve. And, and what do all sins deserve? Death and eternal death, damnation. So the Spirit of God can instill fear in us just by showing us what our sins actually deserve, too. I mean, there's a sense, again, that, that uh, we're liable to God's discipline, or perhaps, you know, there's this fear that I might sin a sin unto death. There's the fear that I might actually not be a Christian, but I can still be a Christian, know that I'm a Christian. And the Spirit of God can still work, uh, a, well, a fear by showing me that the sins that, that even that I commit as a Christian still deserve damnation because, you know what, they do deserve it. Even though we're Christians, those things do deserve damnation if it weren't for Jesus Christ, right? So that, that should make us fear too and should restrain us from sin. It's one of the reasons why Paul says, you know, we shouldn't just sin that grace may abound because the things that we do that are sinful are the things that deserve damnation. They're offensive to God and we need to remember that they are. Um, let's see, the Spirit of God, um, is, is there any way the Spirit of God can instill a, a, some kind of fear in us that would restrain us from sin, that would have to do with other people? That's not very clear. Let me see if I can think of a better way to do it. Um, is, um, if the Spirit of God, uh, is there anything that he can do, well, let me just... Let me just put it this way. can't think of a way to ask the question. Okay. The Spirit of God can also instill fear in us by reminding us of the consequences that our sins can have on others. Okay. Uh, how can, how can, why should we ever be afraid that our sins are going to have consequences for others? How can that restrain us from sin? Okay, we actually talked about that before, didn't we? Okay, now does it make you all at all afraid that by, by doing something, let's say very outwardly sinful, that you're actually gonna harden somebody's heart in sin or that that person may actually end up in hell because of your bad witness? I mean, do the things we do, I think we already mentioned, some you know, the things we do either draw people to Christ or drive people away from Christ. So it's important that when people are reading our lives that um, they see Christ and they don't see you know, flesh. We're not gonna be perfect, of course. But uh, we do need to be careful. We do need, I mean, the Spirit of God will bring that home to us and use it to restrain our sin because not only is it a terrifying thing for us to fall into the hands of the living God, as the author to the Hebrews warned his Christian readers, but it's a terrifying thing for anybody to fall into their hands and to think that I might be part of the, of the reason why this person is rejecting Jesus Christ can, can be a, a rather frightening thing, you know, that I could be partially responsible for their demise. Now, people do end up in hell because of their sins, but we can still provoke them to sin, can't we? So we can become a part of the reason why they go there. We don't, we don't want to do that. So the fear that I might lead somebody to hell through my sins should help restrain me from sinning. And the Spirit of God brings that home to us as well. I, I think you understand what I'm, I'm talking about. Okay. Now let's talk just for a moment about how the Spirit of God uh, you know, does these things. and, and um, I think we can divide it up into two ways and then we'll get to um, uh, how he does it in the unbeliever. But does the, does the Spirit of God uh, ever work directly in our hearts? Okay. Um, yes, he does. I mean, we just read about it in Galatians chapter 5, didn't we? The Spirit is, you know, fighting against the flesh and the flesh is against the Spirit. There's two principles at war within our hearts. We already talked about the sense of his pleasure that I, I sense when the Lord loves me, I sense when he's displeased with me. There is a direct work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to, um, well, to instill both love and, and fear. But does the Spirit of God ever use means to that end? What are some of the means that he uses to instill love or fear? How does he use other people?
Okay, that's right. Okay. Now, I was thinking, because we're going to look at this with regard to unbelievers as well, but this, this is a, a big thing that I don't think we often think about, is that um, the Spirit of God can, uh, can do both of these things through godly society or the church or fellowship. You know how we're always talking about um, peer pressure that's, that's in culture and the negative effects of peer pressure? Are there any positive effects that peer pressure can have? Okay, but what's what's necessary in order to have positive effects from peer pressure? What's that? You need to be around the right people. Be around the right people. That's right. And who are the right people to be around? Christians. Other Christians. So, is fellowship important? Of course. Okay. Fellowship is important because one of the means the Spirit of God uses both to instill fear or love is other Christians. So we need that. And the other means that he uses are, of course, other, let's say, communications of the word. Reading the word of God. I mean, when you read the word of God, does he speak you know, to instill either love or fear in your heart when you read scripture? He can encourage you through the promises. He can encourage you through his, you know, his expressions of love and the fact that that love is yours. He can instill fear in your heart by passages such as uh, the one I just that made reference to it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And of course, one other way that um, the Word of God is communicated that uh, is meant or actually um, ordained by God to bring these things home is through preaching. Uh, the reason why the, the preacher doesn't just get up and, and read a text of Scripture in just sort of a monotone voice is because the Lord wants that word to be brought home with a little bit more pathos. One of the reasons why we sing is because the Lord wants to engage our affections more. But preaching and singing engages the affections more than just simply reading, at least it's supposed to. So these are other means that the Spirit of God uses. Now, I just wanted to uh, pause here for a minute and just think about applying what we've just seen and I think it's, it's fairly obvious. I may have already made the application, so we'll just, let me just mention them, and then we'll go on to how the Spirit of God restrains sin in the unbeliever. So how can we apply what we've just seen? Well, if the Spirit of God uses the Word of God, then we should be in the Word of God more, right? If the Spirit of God uses preaching, or if He uses singing or worship, then we ought to be in worship more or at least as much as we're able to. If he uses godly society and peer pressure, you know, godly peer pressure to uh, restrain our sin, then we should spend as much time in fellowship as we have the opportunity to do that, right? I mean, to not to go to the fellowship of God's people when they're meeting together, knowing that this is going to be a means the Spirit of God is going to use to restrain my sin or to engender more love in me. I mean, I, who am I actually hurting? by doing that. Okay, I'm hurting myself. And we should pray that the Lord would use these means to make us, well to, well, to instill within us more of that love and fear by His Holy Spirit. So again, the Spirit of God restrains our sin by engendering greater love within us and by instilling fear in us. He does it both directly and He does it indirectly through means. And those means are really the means of grace. So that is a very important work of the Holy Spirit. But now here's another important work that he does, and that is restraining sin in the unbeliever. Does, does the Spirit of God do that? Okay, we've already seen that he does that from the Scripture text we looked at. My spirit will not always strive with man. I'm going to give him another 120 years, and then I'm going to destroy him. He restrained the sin of man. Now, we want to look, consider, first of all, the importance of that, and then how the Spirit of God does that in the unbeliever. Now, um, why is it important that God restrain the, or, well, the Spirit of God restrain the sin of the unbeliever? Why is that important? Yeah, believers sinning will not restrain, we would be in big trouble. <laughs> okay. That's right. We would be in big trouble. Why would we be in big trouble? 
Sim had run rampant, and we, we might very well um, be destroyed in the process. Now, we're going to again talk about some of the ways that this happens. So the Lord does this. He restrains the sin of the unbeliever to protect his people. Uh, he protects his people. Why? Because he loves them. Okay, is there any other reason? Okay, he wants to continue to... Okay, he wants to use them to further the kingdom. Okay, he does love them, so he will protect them. He promised it would. He wants to preserve us so that um, the kingdom of heaven can move forward. Can you think of any sense in which God's restraining the sins of unbelievers might even be a mercy to them? Less punishment in hell. If, if God pulled back the restraints on all unbelievers and they just went rampant and they destroyed everything inside and destroyed all of God's people, you can imagine what their judgment would be like in, in hell. I mean, it's going to be bad anyway. But there are degrees of punishment in hell depending upon how many sins a person committed. So if the Lord restrains those sins, then in a certain sense, this is even a mercy on the unbeliever that God is holding back some of their sin, right? All right. Now, how does the Spirit of God restrain the sin of unbelievers? What are some of the ways he does it? This is common grace, by the way, yes. Okay. That's right. If God doesn't want an evil person to fulfill what's in his heart. He will stop him from doing it one way or the other. Sometimes he, he does, sometimes he doesn't. Okay? Uh, sometimes he'll even stop them from uh, injuring his people, and sometimes he won't. Okay? But either way, um, his people are, are blessed, either blessed by uh, having been protected from that or being blessed by actually being taken out of this world and brought to heaven. I don't think anyone who has ever gone to heaven has ever complained. Okay. But we complain and we say, I don't want that to happen to me. You know, we might think about it. Rather, I'd rather be saved, you know, from this circumstance so I can stay here and I can do this and I can do that or I can see my children grow up or whatever it may be. But to depart and be with Christ is very much better. We always need to understand that. So the Lord can do something to redirect them. As a matter of fact, I had an example of that. Do you recall in the... Um, uh, the life of Abraham, how he ventured down into Philistia and the king of the Philistines, Abimelech, saw Sarah and said, uh, well, she's, she's pretty. Uh, who is she? Well, she's my sister. And so Abimelech took her. And then the Lord uh, closed up all the wombs in, a, in Abimelech's house, and he also appeared to Abimelech in a dream and said, you're a dead man. Okay. <laughs> and then Abimelech you know, got his attention, and he said, why? He goes, because you've taken another man's wife. And he said, Lord, I've done this in the innocence of my heart. You know, I didn't know. He told me this is a sister. And God said to him, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Sometimes the Lord intervenes in this way, okay, by restraining the sin of unbelievers. And he certainly did that in Pharaoh's case, didn't he? When he said, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart so he's not going to let the people go when Moses appears before him, well, did God inject his heart full of sin? No, but he removed some of his restraints by which he was restraining the, the absolutely wicked heart of Pharaoh so that his own sin would harden his heart. And that's what the Lord does here. He directly restrains sin. Is there any other way that God restrains the sins of others for the reasons we've already seen, protect his church and the kingdom can go forward? The what of other people? The opinions of other people. Okay. Now, fearing the opinions of other people is, is one of the things that I wanted to, to mention. Peer pressure, even among the ungodly, can still work to restrain sin, because, as long as society is not absolutely wicked, right? Uh, our society will only allow certain things to go on. 
there's still certain things they won't allow. I mean, people just can't shoot people at will and so forth. They may allow a lot of ungodliness, but they restrain a lot of it too, don't they? So there's, there's laws, there's police, and then there's also just peer pressure. What's that? Conscience, that's right. The Lord uses conscience too. Even the unbelievers have consciences and they know when they have done something wrong and the Lord restrains them. Um, by the way, uh, the, one example was used by a seminary professor. He talked about um, this, this book called The Heart of Darkness. I've, I've referred to that a few times where a man uh, went into, you know, left civilized or civilization and went to Africa. And this was, well, it was still uncivilized areas of Africa, I suppose. But back when most of Africa was uncivilized, he went into the heart of darkness, okay? But the point of the book was when he left society and he went to a place where other things may be allowed that weren't allowed in his society, he found out that the real heart of darkness was in him. And the only thing that had been stopping him before were the restraints of society. Uh, if you are put in a situation where there's no morality, or I'm sure there was morality there, but, but it was of a different kind, uh, you can find yourself doing things you wouldn't think you would do if you're an unbeliever. If you're a Christian, You'll still be tempted, but you do have the Spirit of God to restrain you know, that sin. So anyway, the idea of society can restrain unbelievers from doing evil things. The direct restraint what, and, and conscience. And what about the law of God? It doesn't restrain people as much as it should, but those who are aware of it and have anything of the fear of God, it restrains them, yes. Oh, right, right. So one of the reasons, or you're saying one of the reasons why he restrains the sins of unbelievers is to protect them so that they can come to faith in Christ too. That's right. Does anybody have an idea what, of what awakening is? What is it? What is awakening? What's that? Okay, that's right. He convicts them and begins to show them their danger. So they begin to seek after the Lord. Awakening is, uh, as Edwards has said, is the Spirit of God heightening their conscience and making it more sensitive so that they, they feel it much more. Are there times when your conscience may bother you more than at others? Why does it do that? Okay, well, the Spirit of God is, is heightening it. But you see, the Spirit of God works in a different way in, in our conscience than he does in the conscience of the unbeliever. In our conscience, he'll convict us of, of sort of transgressing God's love. And we'll, we'll you know, sense that we've displeased him and, and, and that will be uh, the major part of what conscience is doing for us. But conscience for the unbeliever just condemns them, makes them fear that they've fallen under judgment. Okay, they've done something wrong. But in awakening, that fear is really heightened. So that um, in one instance, I think it was in, um, well, let's see, where was it again? Uh, I forget the name of the city now. It's where Edwards uh, preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. And as he was preaching the sermon, virtually reading it from a booklet, uh, people were screaming and yelling in terror because they felt the ground opening up and hell swallowing them up alive and Edwards was telling him to be quiet so he could finish his sermon. <laughs> I thought that was interesting, but the Spirit of God was working to heighten their, their fear, to heighten their conscience. So awakening is the Spirit of God working through the conscience to restrain sin to the point where people even begin to seek after God. So there's another restraint of the Spirit is in this awakening. So we might say that um, that is a degree, you might say a degree of awakening. Now, understanding the importance of the Spirit of God restraining sin in society and uh, looking at our society to see how that restraint is, is being, you know, is loosening. Why is that restraint loosening? It's basically judgment on our society for our sin. Okay, so society 
is getting worse and worse. Some, some Christians or some churches look at that and they say, if we don't turn around, God's going to judge us. Well, there is a sense in which that's true, but the fact is that the fact that going this way means that God is judging us. As we commit more and more sin, he gives us over to more and more sin. So it's important that the Spirit of God restrains sin. Otherwise, what are we afraid of as a church if, if the restraint gets pulled back too far? Persecution. And why is it the churches get persecuted? Why do Christians get persecuted? It's because the restraint has been pulled back by the Spirit of God. So realizing the importance of this restraint, uh, not just for their sakes, but for our sakes in the advancement of the kingdom of heaven, what should we do then? And, you know, actually, we're going to be going to into prayer in just a few moments. Um, we can take these things into prayer. What should we be praying? Yes. Okay. And praying for our leaders so that they don't come and persecute us. <laughs> That's right. We need to pray for them. Um, okay. So we pray for our leaders. What else should we be praying for? Revival. Okay. What's that? You mean cause the kingdom to grow? Yeah. Okay. And, and revival will certainly do that. Okay. So pray that the Lord would work in the hearts of, of, of the unbelieving uh, leaders. And by the way, if we want, if we want godlier leaders, if we want better leaders, what, what else should we be praying for? What's that? Well, that, we should be praying for them, but uh, who is it that puts these people in office? Okay, the, the society, right? Uh, the, so we should be praying for them too, people who are gonna be voting for leaders. We're never going to have godly leaders unless we have people who want godly leaders. I mean, that's just the way it works in our society. So we need to pray that the Lord's kingdom would extend and that others would want godly leaders too. So pray for our leaders, pray for the people, pray that for revival, pray that God would send his spirit and awaken and convert and restrain. You know, pray for better peer pressure, better society. Uh, again, pray for awakening and for that to take place, there is one other thing we should be praying for, I think. How are we going to see awakening? I mean, how's that gonna take place? Is there anything we need to do? Okay. We need to evangelize. And we need to pray, okay? By the way, I think, um, if we want to see more restraint in society too, as we're praying for our leaders, we should pray that the Lord would give them the grace to incorporate more of his righteous commandments into civil law. I mean, because his, his way is the best. Alrighty, so let's remember that the Spirit of God works to restrain sin. He works in us to restrain sin. And we do need to pray that God would, would give us more of that restraint more directly and use the means by which we might do that, that he works within us to restrain sin by creating a stronger love and by a stronger fear. And those two are not, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I asked what the opposite of love is and it was hate. Fear is not the opposite. So the two can actually coexist. We can fear the Lord and love the Lord. And that's not a contradiction. Okay, and then we need to pray that the Lord would also restrain sin in unbelievers by his Holy Spirit, um, that the Spirit of God would strive more with unbelievers, not just so that we can live a more comfortable life, although we, we can pray that, but so that God's kingdom would advance and that the Lord would be glorified. Okay. Um, he does care for us, and certainly we can pray that God would, uh, would do that for that reason, but let's not forget pray that he would revive, that he would extend his kingdom, that he would restrain sin and change the hearts of our leaders. All of this for his glory and his honor because it dishonors him. What's going on in society right now? All right, are there any questions or comments? No? Then let's close with a word of prayer 
and then let's uh, reassemble in the back and uh, take these things to the Lord in prayer.